Okay, everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, tonight's share is uh, for Erfu Shlema, for Nata Ben Zisela, Ashima Nechama Tova Batsara, Baruch Ben Frida, and for all of those whose health has been affected by the war, and especially for the safe and quick return of our brothers and sisters held in captivity, uh, and uh, for the lasting unity of, of Am Yisrael. Aliyat Neshama for Yitzchak Kirsch Ben Eliezer and Bella Bat Shoshana, and also in the memory of uh, David Miller, and in honor of our writers who provides inspiration to deal with the trauma resulting from the October 7 attack, and for the whole month of Adar Shani, as even after poor, and we're still in Adar Shani, uh, Rina and Mark Costell are sponsoring uh, this year uh, in honor of our writers and for a speedy victory in Gaza and a safe return of all of our chayolim and for a speedy return of all our hostages. Amen. And again, thanks to Hashem, uh, Ador, Purim is man of Yeshua, Geula, and Baruch uh, Hashem, we just had Purim, and may it also be the downfall of the enemies of, of Am Yisrael. Um, I, I want to speak a little bit uh, about uh, Sefer Vayikra as a whole. Uh, we know that Sefer Vayikra uh, is called uh, Torah's Kohanim, the laws of the Kohanim. In fact, that's what Leviticus means, the laws of the Levites, the laws of the Kohanim. And uh, Sefer Vayikra scares a lot of people uh, because there are many, many details of rituals that are unfamiliar. Uh, Baruch Hashem, we have some briskers here, so for them, Kachim is very familiar, very familiar territory. Uh, but for many, many people, uh, it's quite, quite perplexing, quite complicated, quite technical. And yet, Chazal tell us in the Medrash that in the time of Chazal, when they would begin to teach children Torah, they didn't begin with Bereshus. They actually began with the book of Ayikra, dealing with the Korbanos, because the concept was that children were pure and Korbanos are pure, and those who are pure should be Osek in a yonim of purity and holiness and, and, and goodness. Uh, obviously, when there was a Beis HaMikdash, so in a sense, it was easier to familiarize yourself with korbanos because you could actually see a lot of the ritual. You could see how things got carried out. You know, many machloksim of Rishonim, many arguments about commentators is how a certain thing was done. If Lamaisa, you could have seen it, uh, that itself would, would uh, help you a lot. Um, but I want to start off with a very, very basic and very famous, well-known machlokas between the Rambam and the Ramban regarding the significance of karbanas. Karbanas are obviously very important, and indeed we pray three times a day for the restoration of the Beis HaMikdash and the karbanas. But why are karbanas important? Does God really care that you slaughter animals and you burn them? And uh, does God like barbecued meat? Is that uh, what's going on? Reach nichawach, a pleasant fragrance, giving Hashem an offering. What exactly is the purpose? So the Rambam, Maimonides, in the Mari Nebuchim, into the Guide of the Perplexed, uh, part three of the Mari Nebuchim is the Rambam attempts to give reasons for the mitzvahs. Right? That's part three. If time may have mitzvahs. And the Rambam famously says about korbanos, a very interesting thing, that God really does not care about korbanos. God does not care about meat. God does not care about ritual. God cares about our character. God cares that we learn, that we meditate, that we dive in, that we connect to him. So why is this this big deal about Korbanos? So the Rambam says that until the Jewish people came to God when they were still pagans, even before Avraham Avinu, maybe there were no Jews per se, but our ancestors were Ovde Avodizara. They were very strongly attached to paganistic ritual. And one of the attractions of paganism was the pageantry of sacrificial worship, the notion of Kohanim, priests who are dressed up in special uniforms, and they do special rituals. And this was very appealing to a person's sense of ceremony and pageantry. And not today talk that they even went to human sacrifices. Right? I would give up my son in those types of sacrifices. Hashem wanted to wean us away from idolatry and paganism. But if he would have said, we have to go cold turkey on Korbanos, we wouldn't have been able to move away from it because we loved it too much. We enjoyed it too much. So God says, listen, it's like a crutch. If you have to have it, it's like whatever, uh, 
an electric, an electronic cigarette or something. If you have to have it, we'll give it to you, but we'll take it in a framework outside of paganism. And it was a concession to the idolatrous impulse and a means to wean us away from paganist worship. This is what the Rambam says in the Morin Ramban has a long, long arichos in which he attacks the Rambam's thesis for a lot of reasons. First of all, we find that Adam Harishon, from the very beginning of creation, offered korbanos. Kayan and Hevel, remember Kayan offered vegetables, which were not the best, and God did not accept them. But Hevel offered uh, sheep, and God accepted it. Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov brought korbanos. So to simply say it's a concession to people who would otherwise be of the of Odizara ignores the fact that the great predecessors of our people, the founders of Am Yisrael, offered korbanos. Moreover, we pray for the restoration of korbanos. Now, if the pshat is, if the explanation is that korbanos were simply a concession to Avodazara, but inherently they have no value, then, Baruch Hashem, we don't have korbanos today. I'm better off. Now I worship God with prayer and with Torah and with meditation and with good deeds. What am I lacking? I'm not lacking anything. I'm better off. I'm doing a higher level of worship. Why would we pray for the restoration of Karbanas? And rest short that the Rambam davened Musaf, just like we davened Musaf, and the Rambam prayed for the restoration of Karbanas. The Ramban asks, according to the Rambam, why should that be the case? So because of this, the Ramban says it is a Dover Pashut that Korbanos are much more than a concession to the idolatrous impulse of paganism that we have. Korbanos are holy, they're elevating, they bring us closer to God. Korban, Karov, close to God. But the Ramban says it is not the ritual itself that does it, but the transformative effect that the ritual has on the worshiper. That I bring the korban, and it, it goes through all of these motions. The animal is slaughtered and burnt, and then I think to myself, there but for the grace of God goes me, that I deserve this death. I deserve, but God in his mercy has allowed me to have a substitute. So I become transformed. I become uh, subservient to God. I become humble. Or it's a way of expressing my gratitude, shlamim or toda, by the Thanksgiving offering. So the Ramban says, when, when the Torah says a korban is a pleasant fragrance to God, reach nichoach, that doesn't mean the smell of the meat, but it's a symbolic way of expressing the worshiper who has been transformed by the korban gives HaKadosh Baruch Hu nachas ruach, gives HaKadosh Baruch Hu joy, gives HaKadosh Baruch Hu satisfaction because he sees a human being who has learned how to do tshuva, who has become transformed by humility, who has expressed gratitude in tangible ways, whether it's a korban on a sin or whether it's a Thanksgiving offering, those are kind of the two basic modalities. There are different types of korbanos, but the two basic ideas of a korban, according to the Ramban, is number one, it awakens me to repentance and transformation, and number two, it inculcates within me gratitude to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And those are attitudes, and those are transformations that give Hashem a great nachat ruach. Now, it's interesting that it is true that 20th, 21st century man doesn't necessarily have that instinctive feeling for korbanos. You know, we, we study the korbanos, we pray for the restoration of the temple, but most of us, I don't think, honestly can say, I feel that there's something lacking in my worship of God because I'm not bringing korbanos. In fact, uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, who was quite open, uh, said, <laughs> it's something that, you know, you almost... It's almost bad taste to say, but, but he said it. He said, you know, he says he feels he gets a lot more pleasure uh, studying the laws of Korban Pesach than he would by bringing a Korban Pesach. 
He says that the animal is sheep and handle that, you know. But I'll tell you that the fact that we don't really know how to connect to Carbanos doesn't necessarily mean that the value isn't there. Uh, there are some religious sects, Caribbean, etc., which are pagan. They're basically idol worship. But they still engage in animal sacrifice. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll you know, kill a goat, goat or something like that. I don't think they kill cows. They don't kill, you know, big, big animals. But, you know, little goats, little sheep. They slaughter and they burn and they, they do this and that. So I remember years ago reading in Psychology Today. I'm not sure if there's still a magazine, Psychology Today. Uh, this was an interview with the high priest of one of these Caribbean cults. Uh, which relocated to the U.S., this high priest during the week happened to be a, a mild-mannered Chicago accountant, Jewish accountant, Jewish, unfortunately. But on the weekends, he became the Cohen Gadol <laughs> of this uh, sacrificial sect. Now, on one level, that's a tremendous tragedy because I mean, what, what, what is this Jewish guy doing, uh, doing Avodah to demons or whatever it is? But on the other hand, he was describing this mild-mannered Chicago guy with horn-rimmed glasses and everything else that had a picture of him. And he was describing what, Karbana, what sacrifices were like. And he was hitting upon exactly what the Ramban is saying. He says, when you connect to the animal and you lay your hands on the animal, you become one with that life force. And when that life force leaves, you feel your life force is leaving. You're joined to it. And therefore, you become transformed as you realize the fragility of life and how everything depends on God. And I was thinking to myself that it's really true how much we have forgotten the power of these rituals. So at Kedekach, that we can't even mourn for what we don't have because we don't understand what it is. It's like a blind person person who was born blind cannot appreciate color. A person who was born deaf cannot appreciate music because they never saw color. They never heard music. So we cannot appreciate what the Ramban is saying, the transformative color of Korbanos. But apparently it has a tremendous ability to change it. And we yearn for the time that we will merit to have those transformations. Now, the emesis, the Ramban's points are very, very powerful. Meaning, if korbanos are simply a concession to wean us away from idolatry, why would we pray for their restoration? So, a lot of people say, a very standard approach is, that the Rambam is actually moda. The Rambam actually admits to the Ramban that there is a mystical, spiritual, transformative effect to korbanos. But in the Guide to the Perplexed, he didn't state those reasons because the Guide to the Perplexed was written for a philosophically sophisticated audience that is rooted in Greek philosophy, predicated on rationalist thought, that would not necessarily understand spiritual and mystical ideas. So the Rambam gave them a reason that they would be able to grasp, that even if you don't accept anything else, but historically, there is a reason for korbanos because it was a way to take us away from idolatry. But even the Rambam would admit fundamentally that there are deeper reasons, but a person cannot appreciate those reasons until they move into the commitment of, um, of Torah and mitzvot, and then they develop a deeper emuna, a deeper faith, and then they're capable, which actually means this is kind of the... You know, it's been pointed out many, many times that it's almost as if there are two Rambams. And some say it's like it's almost a split personality. Uh, because in the Moran of Uchem, the Rambam is the rationalistic philosopher. In the Mishnah Torah, he points out all of the details of the halachos. Now, the truth is, the Rambam himself says, when he starts giving reasons for mitzvahs, he says... My reasons will only explain the mitzvot in a general way, but they're not going to explain the details. So the Rambam will talk about to fill in as connecting myself to God by my mind, by my strength, by my emotions and feeling. 
But the Rambam says, I'm not going to explain why are it's filled in black, why are they square, why are they leather. In other words, the Rambam says, my reasons are general understandings. They cannot possibly go over the individual reasons. Now, obviously, if you think about it, God must have had reasons for everything. So it's mukrach. In other words, you have to say, in the Rambam's whole analysis, that his reasons are not self-contained, complete ideas. And therefore, they pointed out that the Rambam was pitching the Mora, the guy to the perplexed, to a particular audience, but he was not necessarily saying that those reasons are exclusive. Again, this is a well-known discussion about uh, the Mora and the and, 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 and the like. But this is the big machlokas, the Rambam and the Ramban, if there is a machlokas argument, as to the meaning and the significance of the, of the korbanos. So it's interesting that the Meshech Chachma, the Mer Simcha Kohen of Devinsk, the author of the book Or Semech and the Rambam, the uh, namesake of Tzar Yeshiva, uh, tries to offer a compromise position between Rambam and Ramban. And he differentiates between korbanos that are brought in the Beis HaMikdash or a Mishkan, the tabernacle in the desert, versus korbanos that are brought on bamos, private altars. And here I have to give a little bit of explanatory background. Normally, the rule is, when you have a Beis HaMikdash or a Mishkan in the desert, you're not allowed to bring any sacrifices outside of the Beis HaMikdash. Those are called bamos, private altars. And private altars are normally prohibited, not only when you're bringing them to idolatry, that's obvious, but even if you bring a korban to God, you're not allowed to bring a korban on a private altar. These are called bamos. And the avera of bringing a korban outside of the Beis HaMikdash is called shechute chutz, an iser to slaughter a korban outside of the temple. And to sacrifice it is another love called halah bachutz, not to bring it outside of the temple. And in Parsha Sacharei Mos, both shechitas chutz, shechute chutz, and halah bachutz is a chiyav charis. One is actually chayav, one is obligated death at the hands of heaven. It's a very, very big avail. Throughout Tanakh, in the book of Malachim, you read when it talks about this king was a righteous king who brought people to God, but he was not successful in discontinuing the bamot. People were continuing to bring korbanot on the bamot. So apparently, people were doing it, but it was an avail. However, there are certain periods of history where private altars were permitted. So, for example, in the 70 years, this is a machlokas, but the way the Rambam Paschus, in the 70 years between the destruction of the first temple and the building of the second temple, although we don't have a record of it, halachically, private korbanos could be, altered, could, could be offered. The bamos were permitted between the first temple and the second temple. Earlier, when we first came to Eretz Israel in the days of Yehoshua, so the Mishkan was re-erected in Shiloh for more than 300 years before Solomon's temple. The Mishkan was in the city of Shiloh. 300 years, Yoshua's time, the period of the judges. During that period of Mishkan Shiloh, Bamos were not allowed. But Mishkan Shiloh was destroyed uh, during the years of the last judge, Eli HaKohen, if you remember, we were fighting the Philistines and the Jewish people took the Aaron HaKodesh out of the Holy of Holies and they took it into war thinking that God would give them victory. And unfortunately, very tragically, uh, Eli's sons were killed, the Jewish people suffered a defeat, Shiloh was destroyed, and worst of all, the Aaron HaKodesh was captured by the Philistines. And the book of Shemuel has a very long story how the Philistines, this, this is the ultimate trophy, so to speak. You capture the Aaron HaKodesh, which in a sense they looked at as we vanquished God. And they brought the Ark to their idolatrous temples. And what happened was the Ark toppled the idols, etc. The idols were found cut and destroyed on the ground. 
and the Philistines were afflicted, so they finally said, we've got to get rid of this, and they put the ark on a wagon, and the oxen leading the, the wagon just walked back by themselves, taking the ark back to Eretz Yisrael. And the ark initially was kept in a place called Kiryas Ya'arim, which is Telstone. Uh, and then uh, you know, David HaMelech brought it to Jerusalem. But there was still no temple till Shlomo. So there was a total of more than 40 years in which the Bamos were permitted between Shiloh and the building, in the destruction of Shiloh and the building of the Beis HaMikdash. When the ark was in Kiryat Ya'arim and then Yerushalayim, Bamos were permitted. So the Meshach points out, he wants to suggest, and he has different proofs for this, that the spiritual transformative aspect of a korban is only when a korban was brought in the Beis HaMikdash or the Mishkan. So that would include Shiloh. That would include the first temple. That would include the second temple. But when a, when a korban is brought on a private altar like a Bama, it has no inherent spiritual value. It is only a concession that God gave. So we shouldn't go after our So he wants to make this compromise position that Ramban is correct regarding Beis HaMikdash offerings. Rambam is correct regarding the Heter of Bamos, private altars. So again, though, uh, the period in which Bamos were halakhically permitted were, number one, in the uh, 50 or so years between the destruction of Shiloh and the building of the Beis HaMikdash, and later in the 70 years between the Chorban Bayis Rishon and the building of the Bayis Sheni. Those were periods where Bamos were permitted, and that, the Meshech Chachman wants to say, is only as a concession to idolatry. With this interesting compromise position, the Meshech Chachma offers a brilliant halachic construct. And this is a little technical, so I'm going to try to keep it uh, relatively straightforward, but it is mamish, a brilliant explanation. You'll notice that when I mentioned Bamos were permitted, I only mentioned two periods. I mentioned the 50 or so years between the destruction of Shiloh and the building of Shlomo HaMelech's Beis HaMikdash. So during the reign of David HaMelech, for example, Bamos were permitted, Shoal and David, Bamos were permitted. And then I mentioned the 70 years between the first temple and the second temple. Now, question is, why aren't Bamos permitted today? Let's go over this for a moment. Because the general rule is, when you have a Beis HaMikdash, Bamos are forbidden. When you don't have a Beis HaMikdash, Bamos are permitted. That's exactly why after Shiloh was destroyed, we lost a centralized sanctuary. Bamos are permitted until we get the centralized sanctuary. After the first temple was destroyed, we lost a central Beis HaMikdash. So Bamos are permitted. So the question is, based on that logic, when the second temple was destroyed in the year 70, and we're not yet Zaycha to the building of a second base of Mikdash, why don't we bring, why can't we bring Korbanos today? Meaning the logic seems to allow it to be done because when there's no base on Mikdash, the Bamas are permitted. So let's go back a little bit and ask ourselves this question. Why do we not, or can we not bring sacrifices today? And it really boils down to two questions. Why can't we bring Korbanos on the Temple Mount, putting aside the politics? And number two, why can't we bring Korbanos anywhere because even in my own backyard, let it be a bama. See, those are two different questions, meaning, why can't I bring korbanos in the site of the mikdash? And number two, why can't I bring korbanos not on the site of the mikdash? Because if you don't have a base on mikdash, bama should be permitted. So let's take each of those questions. 
Why can't I bring Korbanos on the site of the Mikdash itself? So this starts off with a fundamental disagreement between another, between Rambam and Ravid, a totally different disagreement. According to the Rambam, the Temple Mount retains its holiness and its sanctity even when the building is physically destroyed. The Shita of the Rambam is the Kedusha of the Harabayas is because of the Shekhinah, because of the divine presence that rested there. That divine presence is not affected by destruction, by Chorban, by Golas. According to the Rambam, the Makaim HaMikdash is holy, even when it's destroyed. That's the Rambam. The Ravid says, no, the Makam HaMikdash no longer has any holiness. When the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed, the Makam HaMikdash became like anywhere else. Now, halakhically you need to understand that each position has a stringency and a leniency. According to the Rambam, because the site of the temple is still holy, if I am ritually impure because of contact to a dead body, I am not allowed to go in that area because when there is a base I make touch, a person whose tummy cannot enter. According to the Rambam, that would apply today. That's why most religious Jews don't go on the Temple Mount. Again, I'm not discussing the boundaries. That's, that's a very important question, but that's not relevant to our discussion. But at least there will be part of the Temple Mount that a Tomei is not allowed to go on to. And according to the Rambam, that still has Kedusha. So like the Rambam, a Tomei person is not allowed to enter the Temple Mount because it's Kadosh. According to the Ravid, actually, it's interesting, the Ravid would say, you could enter any area you want, even the Holy of Holies, because after the Chorban, it lost Kedusha, which means we don't enter the Temple Mount because we're Choshesh, we, we're, we know the Chumra, we follow the view of the Rambam, like the Ravid, it would be Mutter. So that's the Chumrah of the Rambam over the Ravid. But people don't realize there's another side to the coin. That is, since according to the Rambam, the Makom HaMikdash still has Kedusha, according to the Rambam, you would be allowed to bring Korbanot on the site of the temple even without a Beis HaMikdash. Now, you may ask me, wait a second here. Didn't I just contradict myself? I just said, according to the Rambam, you're not even allowed to enter the Temple Mount because you're ritually impure. Well, if you're not allowed to enter the Temple Mount, how could you bring Korbanos on the Temple Mount? Ah, there's a little trick here. And that is, there is a rule in the laws of sacrifices called Tuma Hutra Bitsibor. The laws of ritual impurity are suspended or set aside or permitted, this is not locus exactly how you describe it, to bring communal offerings. So yes, according to the Rambam, if I just want to daven on the Harabayas, or I want to visit the Harabayas, or even if I wanted to bring a private korban on the Harabayas, I'm not allowed to enter. But according to the Rambam, if we wanted to bring the daily offering, or the Musaf offering, or the Korban Pesach offerings, according to the Rambam, we would be permitted to do so, because under the principle of Tumma Hutra B'tzibor, we are permitted to enter the sanctified areas, and the Kohanim are permitted to do the Avodah. Like the Ravid, however, it's the other way around. If I want a Shpitzir on the Harabayas, I want to walk on the Harabayas, I want to daven on the Harabayas, perfectly okay. But if I want to bring a korban on the Harabayas, I cannot. Why? Because since the Harabayat 
doesn't have to do Shah. Bringing a korban on the Harabayat is like bringing a korban in your backyard. And you're over, you transgress the prohibition of a bama. A korban on the temple site, like the Ravid, is like bringing a korban on a bama. So, you might say that we're living in an inconsistent world. Because essentially, the psak halacha that we have is, we don't enter the Harabayat to Davin, and we don't enter the Harabayat to bring korbanot, to bring korban tamid or musaf or korban pesach. Now you might say, no matter how you paskin, we're doing something wrong. If I paskin like the Rambam, that the area has sanctity, I wouldn't be allowed to enter just to daven or to visit, but I would be permitted to bring the korbanos. Like the Ravid, the other way around, I would be allowed to enter and to daven, but I wouldn't be allowed to bring korbanos. So, how could it be that we don't enter and we don't bring korbanos? So, the truth is, this was a live question in the 19th century, different gedolim were talking about the possibility of korbanot on the Harabayat even before we built a base on Mikdash, assuming you could avoid the politics with the Arabs. And Rabbi Kivager, the great Rabbi Kivager, concluded that we cannot bring korbanos today uh, because he said, Ein biadenu, it is not within our power to be machria, to resolve the debate between the Rambam and the Ravid. And therefore, we have to go lechumra. We have to be strict in both directions. Meaning, we have to be strict even though our strictness is inconsistent. We have to say, don't enter the Harabayat at all. Because maybe the halachas like the Rambam that the area is sacred, and if you're Tameh, all of us are in contact with the dead, and we don't have the ashes of Para Aduma to purify us. So you can't enter, because maybe the halakha is like the Rambam, but you can't bring the Korban Pesach, because maybe the halakha is like the Ravid, that the area is not holy, and therefore it's like bringing a Bama. So we have to be Machmer in both directions. This was a live controversy. Now, there are other reasons why we don't bring korbanos. Number one, we're not sure who's a Kohen. Number two, we're not sure about the exact location of the altar. Number three, there are details of the priestly garments that we're not sure about. There is the Temple Institute that makes models, but you know we don't really know. So there are a lot of halachic reasons not to bring korbanos, but one of the reasons is the rivet that because the area is not holy anymore, it has the din of Obama. So this is the question that I got into, and that's, well, wait a second here. Why don't you say the opposite idea? If the area is not holy, then Bama should be permitted. So, Mimanavshach, Mimanavshach means either way, I should be allowed to bring a korban. Let's go with Rebbe Kivager. Let's go with Rebbe Kivager's idea that we don't have the power to decide between the Rambam and the Ravid. Let's go with that idea. But still, I will construct an argument that we should be able to bring, actually not, not a carbon Pesach for reasons I'll discuss, but we should be able to bring the carbon Tamid and the carbon Musaf. Either way. Because here's the argument. Like the Rambam, the site of the temple is holy, so we could bring Karbanas, we have a base of Mikdash. Like the Raivet, the site of the temple is not holy, so we don't have a temple. If we don't have a temple, Vamos are permitted. So I can't bring a Korban in my backyard because maybe like the Rambam I have a temple, so Bamas are not going to be permitted. But why can't I look at the Temple Mount as potentially a Bama? Meaning it's either a temple or it's not a temple. If it's a temple, I got a mikdash. If it's not a temple, I got a bummer. So let it be mutter. 
So the answer is that no. Even if there's no temple, Bamos are not going to be permitted after the destruction of the second temple. And, and the question is why? Because if the normal correlation is when you have a temple, you, can't bring korb- you cannot bring korbanos on Bamos. When you don't have a temple, you could. Then logically, if there's no base on Mikdash and like the Ravid, it doesn't have holiness. Bamos should be permitted, you see? Bamos should be permitted. So the Meshech Chachma says, you see from here, that even if there's no Kedusha on the Temple Mount, like the Ravid, Bamas are still going to be forbidden. Why should that be so? Why should that be so? And he says the following. Based on his argument that any korban that is brought on a Bama is not intrinsically spiritual. It is only a concession to the idolatrous impulse. We have a beautiful explanation why the heter of Bamos would no longer apply. The Gemara in Yuma tells us that at the time that the second temple was dedicated, and in those days you had uh, Ezra, you had Nehemiah, you had the 120 elders who comprised the Anshe Knesset Hagdola, the men of the great assembly. They did a tremendous amount for Am Yisrael. They're the ones who standardized the Shmona Esrei and the Tfilos. They made many, many enactments to enhance religious life. So they took an extraordinary action. They saw that the temple had been destroyed primarily for the sin of idolatry. And the passion for Avodah Zarah was so strong and so destructive. They asked God to take away the Yetzir Hara for idol worship. Now, that's an extraordinary thing to ask God to do. Because the one thing that God never wants to do is interfere with free will and free choice. Because life is about struggling with the Yetzir Hara. You can't just ask God, Oh God, take away my Yetzir Hara so my life will be easier. No. Our job is to struggle with that Yetzir Hara. And yet they said to God, This was a Yetzir Hara that was so powerful, it was so strong, you got to give us a break and take it away. And they fasted for three days. And I think even they were surprised. The Yetzirah for idolatry left us. Now it's represented in a very pictorial way, which I'll discuss. A lion, an aryeh, an aryeh, a lion of fire was seen running out of the Holy of Holies into the Judean desert. And that represented the Yetzir Hara of Avodah Zarah. Very strange. Why would the Yetzir Hara of Avodah Zarah be represented as a fiery lion leaving the Holy of Holies? Hold that thought. So they abolished the Yetzir Hara of Avodah Zarah. That's why you know, we read about all of this idol worship and we don't necessarily have those urges. In fact, the Gemara gives us a story in Sanhedrin that the sages were debating about the King Menashe, who is an evil king, that he doesn't have a share in Olam Haba. So bad. And he appeared to them in a dream And he said to them, you know, how dare you talk about me? Ask me any question you have in Torah, any question whatsoever, and I'll explain it to you. And he was a phenomenal Talmud Chacham. His father was Chizkiel HaMelech, great Sadiq. And Menashe knew everything. And he was saying to them, you know, don't put me down. And they asked Menashe, you're so great in Torah learning. How could you be so aduk, so connected to idol worship and paganism? And he said, if you would have lived in my time, you would have cut your legs running through the thorns 
the barbed wire to get to the closest idol. You have no idea what that Yetzir Hara was like because it got taken away from you. That's the power of the Yitzra, the Avodah that was taken away. The Gemara then goes on and says that the Anshe Knesset HaGdola figured, wow, if Hashem is listening to us, let's try to take away another Yetzir Hara. And they prayed that Hashem should take away the Yetzir Hara of Gile Arayos, sexual immorality. And that was taken away. But what happened was that had untoward effects. People weren't getting married. People weren't having children. They lost sexual desire. It says chickens weren't laying eggs, whatever, whatever it would be. So they realized, they realized that unfortunately we need that Yetzirah to function in the world. So they prayed that we get it back. But it does say that their initial nullification of it is the reason why we have an inherent repulsion towards incest. Meaning apparently when the HR of Arias was at 100%, that even applied to what is incest. There was a Mamashi HR. Today, for most people, there are exceptions, uh, tragically. But for most people, there is no particular Yetzir uh, you know, to be with a sibling or to be with a parent or, or, or whatever, or to be a child, whatever it is. And that comes from the partial beetle of the Yetzir Hara. Now, the Vilna Gaon, well, okay, uh, let me go back before I finish, let me, let me go back a little bit. So when they took away the Yetzir Hara of idolatry, it was a lion, a fiery lion, leaving the Holy of Holies, the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Why is that so? I mean, why would Avodah Zarah be connected to the Kodesh HaKadoshim? The Holy of Holies. That means it was an elevated thing. So the Emma says, if you look in the Rambam, so I'm quoting different Rambams tonight, the, the Rambams are not necessarily connected. In Hilchos Avodah the Rambam gives a very, very interesting historical origin for paganism. I mean, after all, God created Adam Arisha. So Adam Arisha knew there was one God. So how did Avodah start? So the Rambam says a very fascinating theory. And that is, Avodah Zarah started in the generation of en Enosh. He was one of the generations between Adam and Noah. And it was based on a very spiritual calculation. People knew that the Almighty was the creator of heaven and earth. But they saw that it was a certain arrogance to be able to think you could approach God for your mundane needs. You know, you wouldn't go to the president to handle your garbage collection or whatever it would be. And they saw a world in which God seemed to have many subordinate powers. The sun, the moon, the planets, the stars. And they said, instead of praying to God, we will pray to God's servants and God's delegates who they thought had some autonomous power to do things. So originally, Avodah Zarah was not a denial of one creator, but they were such in awe of HaKadosh Baruch that they felt they were not worthy to approach him. They needed intermediaries. This is actually very similar to the Chet HaEgel in the Midbar, which was the same type of thing. So originally, Worshipping idols or worshipping representations or worshipping intermediary forces was still giving homage to God. Eventually, it became, in the course of the centuries, it became a new talk. It became severed from monotheism and became a polytheistic, paganistic ritual. But the origin of Avodah Zarah was worshiping God through the intermediary forces of creation because they were too much in awe of HaKadosh Baruch to turn to him directly. Now, which means the origin of Avodah Zarah comes from a reverence of God taken to an unhealthy, improper direction. Now, it, it's similar kind of to the process of 
a lobotomy or a lobectomy, right? Then the, uh, they, don't, they don't do it as much today as they used to. But let's say a person has epilepsy, certain seizures or the like. So they cut out part of the brain to prevent the seizures. But in cutting out part of the brain, there will often be a diminution, a diminishment of certain capacities. You take out the bad, you're also taking out the good. T destroying the Yetzir Hara of Avaidazara was a spiritual lobotomy. Basically, what God said was, your reverence for Hashem is too strong. It's too powerful. It's leading you in bad directions. So we're going to take away some of your fear of God. So you will not feel necessary to go to the intermediaries. Now, do you see what happens here? The reason why we have less of a Yetzir Hara for Avodah Zarah is because we have less Yeras Shemayim than we would have had naturally. Like how many people say, how many of us say, this would be a new excuse not to go to davening in the morning. He says, I can't go to show. I am too in awe of the Creator to approach Him. I am overwhelmed with Yira. I feel inadequate. I feel I'm not worthy. And therefore I have to turn to something else. So now that I, now that I don't have the HR of Avodah so God is my buddy, God is my friend, no problem. In other words, we lost something. We lost something when the Eight Sahara of idolatry was taken away. We lost a deep awareness of the greatness of God. And God took it away because that greatness became paralyzing. That greatness became too inhibiting. So God took it away. But Nebuch, we are diminished people. We are mediocre people. Because to have that feeling, to the height of that feeling, would have paralyzed us. And that is why we lost the Yetzirah of idolatry at the same time that we lost prophecy. The two come together. Prophecy is the deep awareness of God in a good way. Avodah Zarah is the deep awareness of God that scares you away. That deep awareness can lead to the most wonderful intimate connections. And it can lead to a paralysis of fear. So God's judgment was, let's take it away. But it's not that we're better. We're a lot worse. But it was taken away like a lobotomy because it was too dangerous. And that's why it's represented as a fire, passion, coming out of the Holy of Holies. Because in its origin, there was a holiness that was taken away from us. Very, very amazing. The Yitzra of Avodah Zarah, the Yitzra Hara of Avodah Zarah was something very holy, an awareness of the awesome greatness of Hashem that became paralysis, and therefore it had to go. This actually explains a comment of the Vilna Gaon. Uh, the Vilna Gaon has a pithy little comment that says, if we want to know how strong the Eight Sahara of idolatry was, uh, it's the Eight Sahara of money, that the Eight Sahara of idolatry got replaced with the Eight Sahara for money, which is a very strong driving force within many, many people. But you see the difference. The Yetzirah of Avodazara was a Yetzirah to connect to God, but I felt I was not worthy, so I will connect to God's intermediaries. Money is just a pure materialism, meaning we no longer have that driving desire to connect to God. So this is very extraordinary. So says the Meshach Achma Pashat, now we understand no, the normal halachic correlation is when you have a temple, bamos are prohibited. When you don't have a temple, bamos are permitted. That's why when Shiloh was destroyed and you had more than 50 years uh, until the Beis HaMikdash, bamos are permitted. And that's why when the first temple was destroyed, 
have 70 years, Bamos are permitted. So the question is, why shouldn't Bamos be permitted after the destruction of the second base of Mikdash? Right, we said, according to the Ravid, uh, the temple doesn't have holiness, and Bamos are prohibited. Why are Bamos prohibited? Like the Ravid, Bamos should be permitted. The answer is this. Very, very brilliant. If Bamos are inherently not a valid form of worship, they are only a concession to the idolatrous impulse. Since we no longer had the Yetzirah for Avodah because that was taken away at the beginning of the second temple period, the Mela, there's not going to be a Heter of Bamos. Meaning, when do I say when there's no temple, Bamos are permitted? When you have the Yetzirah of Avodah and you need to be weaned away from it, so God gave you a way to bring a Korban. But when you don't have the Yetzirah of Avodah then there is no Heter of Bamos, even without a temple. And that's why Ramir Simcha says, that the, the rule that historically had applied, when there's a temple, you don't have private altars. And when there's no temple, you have private altars. That correlation breaks down with the destruction of the second temple because you no longer have the Yetzirah of idolatry, which would allow you to bring a Korban on Obama. Right? It's brilliant, brilliant. So he connects it to that uh, idea. And that's why Bisman Hazer, Bamas are not permitted. Uh, the only thing is, like the Rambam, the temple has holiness, so you should be able to bring korbanos on the temple mount, and that's why Rabbi Kivager says that yes, but like the Ravid, it's not holy, and therefore bringing a korban on the temple mount would be a bama prohibition, and that's why we're not allowed to bring it. Uh, just as a little aside, it is interesting that the law that korbanos can only be brought when there's a base amikdash. And today, there's, if there's no temple, the Bamos are prohibited. That only applies to Jews. Non-Jews are also permitted to bring korbanos, and they can bring korbanos outside of the Beis Hamikdash, even on Obama. So theoretically, it is actually permitted for a Noahide, a righteous non-Jew, to bring a sacrifice. Not on the Temple Mount, because non-Jews should not enter the Temple Mount, but to bring a sacrifice in their backyard. Or on Mount Zion, or, or Mount Olives, Harazason, whatever it would be. And a few rabbis, a few rabbis, a few maverick rabbis, have actually called upon non-Jews to reinstitute a sacrificial rite. Now most uh, poskim have said that is an awful idea. But they have not questioned that halachically. Halachically, it actually is permitted. But number one, uh, any type of sacrificial activity is likely to raise, you know, Arab war, etc. Right now we're in a war, but uh, whatever, it would make it worse or, 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 or the like. But number two, they said it's a source of great confusion. Because if I see Goyim bringing korbanos, then I'm going to figure that, hey, if they can do it with rabbinic approval, then of course I can do it, not knowing that for me to do it would be an iser diaraisa of bringing a korban outside of the base of Mikdash. You see, so to have a situation where non-Jews are permitted to do something and Jews are told they can't do it would be very, very crazy, and therefore it's much better not to have non-Jews bring korbanos. So I am not in favor of non-Jews bringing korbanos, but once again, halachically, it actually would be permitted. The truth is the, the halachic case to allow it is 100% clear. I don't even think there's any, any machlokas about that. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, korbanos that I wanted to share with you. Uh, I just want to end uh, with uh, a little story that's connected to the Parsha. Uh, the Balatanya, Rav Shneer Zalman, the first Chabad Rebbe, once had a Talmud who um, was hanging around people who were not the best influence for him. They would drag him down in various ways. So the Balatanya called him in and said, listen, I know there's a mitzvah to love Jews, etc., but you're hanging around with people that are going to be a bad influence on you. They're going to drag you down. They're going to take you away from Torah and mitzvahs. It's better to keep your distance. So the person said, Rebbe, don't worry about me. I'm impervious to pressure. I've been your student for many years, and I haven't gotten better. I haven't learned from you, 
So if being with you hasn't made me better, then being with them is not going to make me worse. You know, I am what I am. I stay what I am. So don't worry about me. I'm impervious to pressure. So the Bhagavatanya said, you're making a very, very big mistake. Just because you haven't gotten better by being with me doesn't mean you're not going to get worse by being with them. And he pointed out the following. Let's imagine halachically. Now the Torah talks about the holiness of korbanos in this parsha, And specifically it mentions that if I have the meat of a korban, the meat of a korban, let's say the meat of a sin offering that can only be eaten by kohanim, and can only be eaten within a certain time, and can only be eaten in a certain place. So it says, call us your yiga bipsara. Any other food that touches the sacrificial meat gets, sacri gets uh, sanctified. Call asher yiga bipsara yiktash. Now, if I read that Pasuk literally, that would mean if an apple touches a piece of sin offering meat, the apple can only be eaten by a Kohen, can only be eaten within the time of a sin offering, can only be eaten in the courtyard of the temple. And yet the Gemara explains that's not emis. When it says anything that touches the meat is sanctified, it does not mean touching. It means if you cooked it with the meat. In other words, if I cooked rice or potatoes or other meat with the sacrificial meat, like tray, like everything else, it absorbs the taste of the sacrificial meat. And at that point, the whole mixture has to be eaten only by Kohanim in the base of Mikdash. So yiga does not mean anything that touches the meat but only that which gets absorbed through a cooking process. So, Kedusha is not transferred by casual contact. Kedusha is only transferred by immersion, by cooking, by being steeped, by being marinated in it. Now, let's apply the same rule to impurity. Let's imagine I have a, an apple that came in contact with a dead body or a dead animal. It's in the same building. So the apple is tame. The apple is ritually impure, which, by the way, for Yisrael does not necessarily mean anything, but a Kohen should not eat it. At least Bizman HaMikdash, because he wouldn't be able to eat truma. What is the rule if the apple, that's tame, touches the banana. So the halacha is, the banana also becomes tamay. Again, so there's complicated rules, but the basic idea is, the dead animal touches the apple, so the apple is called rishon. It is a first degree tuma after the source. The uh, apple touches a banana, the banana is called a sheni. And a rishon can make a sheni. And for a truma, you can go to a shlishi. For a karbanis, you can go to a revi. So what do you see? You see an interesting dichotomy. Holiness gets transferred only by cooking, not by touch. Impurity gets transferred by mere touch. I mean, that's the halachic dichotomy. So says the Balatanya, that's your situation. Yeah, you had contact with me. But it was casual. It wasn't conscientious. You didn't immerse yourself. You didn't cook yourself in my Torah. So the holiness didn't pass. But for Tuma, for impurity, even casual contact is enough. So the fact that you didn't get better from me doesn't mean you're not going to get worse <coughs> from them. Because Tuma can be spread by casual contact. Kedusha requires the immersion of being cooked in it, in which you have to kind of bring it into your kishkas, so to speak. And therefore, unfortunately, it is easier to be influenced in negative ways than it is to be influenced in positive ways. That's a sobering lesson, unfortunately. Uh, but it does mean that it's very, very, very easy 
to be dragged down in negative environments. Now, I don't want to get into the whole discussion about how we raise our children. I mean, this is the justification, so to speak, why many parents will opt for a more insular environment. Uh, there is a downside where they separate from non-religious people and the like. On the other hand, uh, the argument goes that by creating insularity, you're creating divisions, divisiveness, a lack of avat Yisrael. So maybe it's important to be able to have that. So that's a difficult balance that people have to think about, meaning the need to reach out, the need to connect, uh, the need to love every Jew versus the need to protect yourself from negative influences. But one thing I will tell you, it depends how you define a negative influence. You know, I, I work in our Sameach, and you know, most of our students, not all of our students, but most of our students come from non-observant families. So they often ask questions when they have their own, when they get married and they have their own children, can I let my child go to my, you know, grandmother, or go to my mother, et cetera, who may not have, uh, you know, may commit sins like Hetra Mechira, whatever, you know, the worst of Eris, uh, and, and, and the like. And here's the thing to keep in mind. The Chazanis says this. The Chazanis said that of all of the bad influences that are most contagious, it is bad midos that are the worst. Meaning like this. If I have a choice to, to have my child go to two people, one is a person who is less ritualistically observant, but a fine midos. And the other is a very firm person with bad midos. The danger of the bad influence is much more so with bad midos. Bad midos are much more contagious because a child, even a little child understands, and it's quite amazing, things about kashras and shabbos. You can tell the child, listen, we love grandma, grandma's wonderful, but if grandma gives you something without a hechsher, in fact, kids even like that game. It's like a game, kids love rules. So you say, it has to have the OU, you know, the U and the O. If it doesn't have the OU, you can't eat it. So the kid will look and say, oh, it doesn't have any you, you know, whatever, whatever it's going to be. Uh, and if there are good meetups, of course, the grandmother is going to work with it. Not going to try to undermine. But when you have supposedly from people who are rude, who are loud, who are insulting, who are cynical, those attitudes do rub off. So it's true. We got to be very, very careful to protect our children from bad influences. But we have to have a better definition of what really is a bad influence. And sometimes we're defining bad influence in a wrong way. We think as long as the kashras and the Shabbos is maintained, the midos don't matter. When in reality, it's the other way around. The midos are more important because a child can understand religious ritualistic boundaries. But character things are much more contagious. So when we think about what's a bad influence, we should very much be thinking in that direction. So thank you for coming. Sure.